Hey there friends, Dave from Light of Scania, Missing Project, copyrighted edition for a video channel. And this is a Bigfoot class. One of an ongoing series that's been going on for 12 weeks. And uh, I appreciate that the class is still going and we're still learning together. And before anybody who's jumping in midstream here thinks that I'm claiming to be an expert, no. I happen to be somebody that's uh, studied the topic pretty thoroughly and I, I probably know a little more than the average Joe but no expert and I'm, I'm going to be feeding you information that's from documents well known and uh, part of what I studied to get to where I am today and that's the path I'm trying to lead you on as well. So for starters how do we get our opinions about Bigfoot? Well, in politics, and just like in life, our opinions are molded by what we're watching on the boob tube, on YouTube, on <laughs> the, hearing on the radio. There's a great book written by a woman named Cheryl Atkinson who was the chief investigative reporter for CBS and it's called Smear, Smeared. And it explains how some of the most, what you think, reputable news agencies are just propaganda machines. And they are paid by different parties to form your opinion. And what you're watching, you may be thinking is a news story and in reality, it's all pure garbage to make you believe a certain way. And a lot of what is out there about Bigfoot is the same thing. Uh, as an example, Monster Quest. They used Jeff Meldrum a lot in that series. And why'd they use Jeff? He's well-spoken. He comes across well on, on screen. He's got some very high academic degrees. He's a professor in Idaho. And just because of that, people will listen to you. And because of those degrees, all of a sudden you have instant credibility. So his views carry a lot of weight in the TV world. And that's why in that world, you see him a lot. And I think some people will just leverage that education and think, oh, he must be telling the truth. Well, that's one way to look at it. On the other hand, Monster Quest has to do whatever Discovery Channel or History Channel or whoever it may be, the contracts with them tells them to do. That's what they do. Contrary to what you think, that these independent production companies are kind of on their own to do their own thing, eh, not true. They have to get everything approved from the very top. So going back to how your ideas and thoughts are developed. I've talked about Wikipedia a lot, and I talk about it because the founder of Wikipedia said, don't believe their sources and don't believe their articles. The founder said this in a news article because he said he lost control of it. And what he sees there is just a lot of propaganda and a lot of twisted stories, but not a lot of facts. Well, <laughs> First time I ever did it, I went over to Wikipedia and I looked up Bigfoot. Let's go, let me read you a little bit of what it says. And it's a lengthy post, so I won't read all of it. It says, Bigfoot, also commonly referred to as Sasquatch, is a purported ape-like creature said to inhabit the forests of, forest of North America. So for starters, apes don't stand erect. Apes don't swim in the water. And everyone would agree that Bigfoot is exactly that. So ape-like, I don't understand that from the very beginning first sentence. 
But what they're do, there's a, they're acclimating you to that ape topic. Many dubious, many dubious. So they're saying, question this from the beginning. Articles have been offered in attempts to prove the existence of Bigfoot. <coughs> I love this including anecdotal claims of sightings as well as alleged video and audio recordings, photographs, and casts of large prints, some of which are known to be admitted hoaxes. So they're already telling you to discount it. See that? Tales, now this next paragraph threw me a little bit. Tales of wild, hairy humanoids exist throughout the world, and such creatures appear in the folklore of North America including the mythologies of indigenous people. Bigfoot is an icon within the fringe subculture of cryptozoology and an enduring element of popular culture. So now you're a young person and you read that and you think, hmm, okay, let's go look up what cryptozoology is. Oh, that's a study of unknown animals. But at the beginning it said hairy humanoids. Well, that's kind of confusing, isn't it? I've never said it was part of a cryptozoology topic. Either did the Russians, but they're telling you it is. The majority of mainstream scientists have historically discounted the existence of Bigfoot. Oh yeah, so the majority of scientists do, so why should you? Considering it to be the result of a combination of folklore misidentification and hoax rather than a living animal. So again, they're acclimating you, it's an animal if you want to believe that. Some alleged alleged observations describe Bigfoot as more man-like. Whoa! With reports of human-like face. Well, son of a gun! In 1971, multiple people in the Dalles, Oregon filed a police report describing an overgrown ape and one of the men claimed to have sighted the creature in the scope of his rifle, but could not bring himself to shoot it because it looked more human than animal. Oh, I think Dave said that in an earlier class. Using his forensic artists. That's right, I did, huh? And there it is in Wikipedia. Wow. Alleged vocalizations. I like this section. Alleged vocalizations such as howls, screams, moans, grunts, whistles, and even a form of supposed language have been reported and allegedly recorded. Some of these alleged vocalizations recordings have been analyzed by individuals such as retired U.S. Navy cryptologic linguist Scott Nelson. He analyzed audio recordings from the early 1970s said to be recorded in the Sierra Nevada mountains, dubbed the Sierra Sounds, and stated, it definitely is a language, it definitely is not human in origin, and it could not have been faked. i got to give them to him for putting that in. Now, animals don't have language that we can identify. So what does that mean? It goes back to human. Remember this. They're throwing little hints out there. But then they're playing both sides of the spectrum and they're not, they're not being fair on a lot of things. Then they said Bigfoot can be misidentified as bears, escaped apes, humans, and hoaxes. Well, son of a gun. In one of my books, I talked about alleged misidentification of Bigfoot. Sorry, friends. you got to be able to a complete moron to not know the difference between a bear and a Bigfoot. Sorry. That's like the a person in a bank robbery seeing somebody come in and misidentify the bank robber as a white person or a black person. That's, that's a discrepancy. And that's the difference. Bears have a big long snout. Bigfoot doesn't have a snout. Bears rarely, rarely, rarely walk upright. They do sometimes, but it's very rare. And it's a very awkward motion. Then they talk about Gigantopithecus. Fossil jaw of extinct primate. Bigfoot proponents Grover Krantz 
and Jeff Bourne both believe that Bigfoot could be a relic population of extinct Southeast Asian ape species Gigantopithecus blackie. According to Bourne, blackie may have followed the many other species of animals that migrated across the Bering Land Bridge to Americas. To date, no Gigantopithecus fossils have been found in the Americas. In Asia, the only recovered fossils have been of mandibles and teeth, leaving uncertainty about G. Blackie's locomotion. Crances argued that Blackie could have been bipedal based on his extrapolation from the shape of its mandible. <laughs> what? However, the relevant part of the mandible is not present in any fossils. <laughs> The more popular view is that Blackie was a quadruped, as its enormous mass would have made it difficult for it to adopt a bipedal gait. Okay, I gotta give them to them there. They kind of put down that idea. But still, you hear people saying, well, it could be this, even though there's no evidence it's ever been in North America. None. No Blackie hair, no Blackie fossils. I don't get it. Then they go on to the Patterson-Gimlin film. The most well-known video of an alleged Bigfoot, the Patterson-Gimlin film, was recorded in October 2067 by Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin as they explored an area called Bluff Creek in Northern California. The 59.5 second long video, which is not true, it's almost two minutes long, again, false part Wikipedia, has become an iconic piece of Bigfoot lore and continues to be highly scrutinized, analyzed, and debated. Academic experts from fields have typically judged the film as providing no supportive data of any scientific value. Oh, shit. Oh. Doug Hycheck from Monster Quest must, must be rolling around on his bed right now, screaming if he's watching this, because it's completely not true. Locomotion experts have talked about this at length. Talked about the stride. Talk about how the foot hits the ground and moves. Talks about the muscles in the back and the buttocks moving. Are they talking to, to a bunch of idiots there? I don't know. <sighs> so frustrating. Now, that's Wikipedia. If you look at my Wikipedia page, it's worse. <laughs> I've written three books on Bigfoot, 11 books on missing people. I've done no movies on Bigfoot. I've done no specials on Bigfoot. I've done three movies on missing people and a two hour special on the History Channel on missing people. Yet, if you read my Wikipedia page, it's like I spent my whole life doing Bigfoot. And I was there just to do one thing, prove its existence. 100% not true. <laughs> I've never said that because I was paid by some very wealthy people to go out and research the topic. And wherever I ended up, that's where they wanted me to end up because they trusted my investigative ability. Again, Wikipedia is, on my page, 90% lies. On that page I read you about 50% lies. So, uh, don't ever quote it if you want to be right. Earlier in the class, I talked about this. The track record. Uh, it was by Ray Crow. It went from 91 to 2007, over 3,000 pages in here. And uh, Ray did a, a variety of things in this newsletter. And what I did is I scanned all of it, put it on a USB, and you can enlarge it to as long as long as wide as you want to to read it. It gets too large, it kind of gets distorted, but you can read every page, trust me. And like there's over 3,000 UFOs, Bigfoot, Chupacabra, all kinds of things that Ray was interested in, things I was interested in. And in there, one thing that really got me going was stories related to Native American in history. You see, I'm one of these people that believes we study history for a reason, and we specifically study Native American history for a reason. They were here way before us white people were, 
and they've been dealing with the issues out here in the Americas long before we arrived. So there was one of the track records and I'll let you look at the picture here on the front cover of this special edition. Face looks pretty human to me. And this is a track record special edition number 14. And Ray did this and the majority of this has to do with Native American stories related to Bigfoot and how the different tribes viewed Bigfoot. And herein lies something that you won't hear about on TV specials hardly ever. Why? Because it doesn't fit the paradigm that they're trying to feed you. Uh, many of these talk about Bigfoot having special paranormal abilities over and over again. You won't hear about that here on these shows. So let's start off first one. I'm going to read you some things, and uh, I'm not going to read lengthy, but I'll read you some. It says, traditional attitudes towards Bigfoot in many North American cultures. Here in the Northwest, west of the Rockies, generally Indian people regard Bigfoot with great respect. He is seen as a special kind of being. Because of his obvious close relationship with humans, some elders regard him as standing on the border between animal-style consciousness and human-style consciousness which gives him a special kind of power. It's not that Bigfoot's relationship make him superior to other animals. In Indian culture, unlike Western culture, animals are not regarded as inferior to humans, but rather as elder brothers and teachers of humans. But tribal cultures everywhere are based on relationship and kinship. The closer the kinship, the stronger the bond. Man in, many Indian elders in the Northwest refuse to eat bear meat because of the bear's similarity to humans, and Bigfoot is obviously much more similar to humans than is a bear. As beings who blend the natural knowledge of animals with something in the distinctive type of consciousness called intelligence that humans have, Bigfoot is regarded as a special type of being. So this is out of Traditional Attitudes Towards Bigfoot in Many North American Cultures, written by Gail Highpine. Next paragraph, but special being as he is, I've never heard anyone from a Northwest tribe suggest that Bigfoot is anything other than a physical being living in the same physical dimensions as humans and other animals. Well, she hasn't been around much. He eats, sleeps, poops, he cares for his family members, however, among other Indians elsewhere in North America, is why they separated as the Hopi, Sioux, Iroquois, in Northern Athabascan, Bigfoot seemed to be more as a sort of supernatural or spirit being, now we're getting there, whose appearance to human is always meant to convey some kind of message. Yeah. Ray Owen, son of a Dakota spiritual leader from Prairie Island Reservation in Minnesota, told a reporter from the Red Wing Minnesota Republican Eagle, quote, they exist in another dimension from us, but can appear in this dimension whenever they have reason to, to. See, it's like there are many levels, many dimensions. When our time is one is finished, we move to the next. But the big, big man can go between. The big man comes from God. He's our big brother, kind of looks out for us. Two years ago, we were going down here really self-destructive. We needed a sign to put us back on track, and that's why the big man appeared. Ray Wolf, a visiting Athabascan Indian from Alaska, told the reporter, in our way of beliefs, they make appearances at troubled times to help troubled Indian communities to get more in tune with Mother Earth. Bigfoot brings signs and messages that there is a need to change and a need to cleanse. Cross-dimensional. I've told you about this before. And I've told you before that physicists are studying this right now. It's not a question if there are other dimensions. It's a question of to understand it better. And you've even heard this discussed on Skinwalker Ranch before. They know. It's something that we're dealing with right now. 
it's just not in your wheelhouse on TV as much as it's going to be in the future. Okay, and then it goes on to say, stories about small humanoids who inhabit wild places are found in many areas of the world, especially Europe. The Kiowa tell a story about several young men who decide to go exploring south from their Texas home for many days, seeing many new things until they came to a strange forest, obviously the jungles of southern Mexico, whose trees were home to small, furried humanoids with tails. This they found to be too weird, so they immediately headed back home. I never thought to reconnect the stories about the little people with the Sasquatch until Ray Crow brought up the possible connection. After all, if there may be large relatives of humans living in remote areas, would it be so impossible that there be small ones? Details that stretch credibility, such as pots of gold, pointed and belled caps, games and nine pins, etc., could conceivably be embellished and added over generations. So, almost native, almost all Native American cultures have these little people as being part of their lifestyle and background. The existence of Bigfoot is taken for granted throughout North America. So are their powerful psychic abilities. Hmm. I can't count the number of times that I've heard elder Indian people say that Bigfoot knows when humans are searching for him and that he chooses to when and to whom make an appearance. And that his psychic powers account for his ability to elude white man's efforts to capture him or hunt him down. In Indian culture, the entire natural world, the animals, the plants, rivers, and stars is seen as a family, and Bigfoot is seen as one of those close relatives, the great elder brother. So, when you hear about these, I'll say it politely, fools, that go out to kill a Bigfoot. Do they really know what they're trying to hunt? Before you go out to hunt anything, study it a little bit. Know its mannerisms. Know its background. Do these people that are hunting Bigfoot have any idea what they're hunting? Now, in the middle of this book, there's a story here, it's called, and it's from the uh, February 26th, 84 Register Guard from Eugene, Oregon. China claims new wild man clues. The Chinese Wild Man Research Institute claims there's new evidence of at least eight gargantuan hairy creatures roaming the forest of Hubei province, the elusive wild men of history and legend. Known as China as the Yeren, the wild men have been described as 10 feet tall with tufts of red hair and clod-hopping five-toed feet. Some say they have ape-like heads. Others claim they have bills like giant ducks. As with America's Bigfoot and Scotland's Loch Ness Monster, witnesses have failed to produce convincing photos or other absolute proof. Areas where the wild men are said to roam are off-limits to foreigners. The search for these purported man beasts, which started hundreds of years ago and is recorded in Chinese history books and poems, occasionally is reported by China's state run communist press. So, their press restricts their information that they can hear and read. Sound interesting? Li Zhuan, Secretary General of the Chinese Wild Man Institute, in Wuhan, Hubei's capital published his claims in an article on Friday's Worker Daily, seen Saturday in Peking. Li claims researchers at the Wuhan Medical College, well, isn't that special? Wuhan studying Yaren or Bigfoot, and that's where the virus supposedly, maybe, possibly, somewhere got started. I don't know if it did. I'm just saying that some people have claimed that. Now, this is interesting. Lee claims researchers at the Wuhan Medical College recently examined hairs of eight kinds of red-haired wild men and concluded eight of the creatures exist in the back country of Hubei, a province of central China. The wild men have eluded scientists. Lee's article said that in 1980, Hubei commune 
caught a little wild man in an animal trap. Unfortunately, the superstitious Pooh thought that the beast was a reincarnation of a friend who had died two months before and was now visiting him, so they set it free. In southeast China's Zhejiang province, villagers killed a creature they thought was a monster, cut it up, and sent parts to local officials for a reward in 57. However, scientists determined later the creature was a short-tailed monkey. Oops. More monkey. But we're gonna get we're gonna hear more about this in a little bit. Now let's talk a little bit about the what different tribes and cultures think in North America. Kushtika or the Otter Man. So just a short note to tell you that the name of the Tinglets and Haida is used for Bigfoot is Kushtika. A legend he is the Otter Man and it is pronounced Kush Te Ka. Well, Ray got this letter and I'll read it to you. My name is X. I live in Hawaii now, but I'm from Seattle. I hope you don't mind me typing this, but I am here anyways. Being Native American, I've grown up hearing stories about Bigfoot from older relatives. But I think you might be more interested in a story about a half man, half land otter. It's an old Haida Tinglet story that my grandma told me. You might want to investigate it for yourself. See, it lives deep in the woods or on islands and it whistles through its teeth and it lures people into a trance. And they go up there in the woods never to be seen again. That's basically what the old tales say. But back in the 50s, 50s the Cloak, not sure of the spelling, near Heidelberg and, Craig, and Queen of uh, Prince of Wales Island in Southeast Alaska, a woman was sitting at home alone. Recently, her husband disappeared while out hunting. They believe it got him, but she felt like something was watching her, and the next morning they found footprints near her window. So man, men gathered at her house the next night. It came back, and they went to get it, but it was gone. They can't come unless invited and stuff. If you find my story interesting and want to use it, go ahead, but please don't disclose anything about my identity. Interesting. Now, there was an article... June 14, 1982, that I thought was fascinating. Is Sasquatch an alien robot from space? A Sasquatch sighting last week indicates the legend of a man-ape creature in the Pacific Northwest may be a robot from outer space, says John Beckford, director of Project Bigfoot. Beckford, Beckard said U.S. Forest Service tests indicating... And following a reported sighting near Walla Walla, Washington last Thursday, indicated a creature weighing at least 5,000 pounds. Now, remember I told you that the tracks sometimes are really deep in the ground, and it makes no sense because I could jump up and down at 200 pounds, and I couldn't make a dent in the ground, and this thing is making a huge dent. This is an incredible weight, he said. It indicates that whatever it was, it was huge. Maybe we have something from outer space. Something really weird. Wei Long, fire manager for the agency's Walla Walla District, said watershed patrolman Paul Freeman reported seeing a creature nine feet tall, 50 to 75 yards away in a logging road. Footprints later found were an inch and a half deep and measured 14 long and seven wide with an eight foot between strides, Long said. When 5,000 pounds of pressure was applied to a metal plate, the shape of a footprint, the plate went half an inch into the ground. Something made them, Long said. I don't think a man would make them. They just went too far into the ground. I've worked in the woods a long time and I've never seen tracks like this before. I've seen a lot of bear tracks, but nothing like this. Freeman said the creature was reddish brown, covered with hair, walked on two legs. This was in the Eugene, Oregon Safeguard, June 14, 82. So, remember what Dave said. Something's odd about this. Too many times the prints are too deep to be an average, even humanoid. So I've never seen that article before, so that's why I want to read it to you. Encounters with Matakagmi. Matakagmi. This came from uh, Info Journal, Springs, 1970, 
Many Smokes, National American Indian Magazine, Fall 68. My grandfather was, uh, this is a good story, this is a very famous story that I first read, only part of it, hmm, probably 15 years ago. And I could never understand where it emanated from until I saw this. So now you're going to hear it. My grandfather was born in Upper California country near Mount Shasta. This was in the year of 1853. He fought in the Modoc Indian War, 72 to 73, in defense of the homeland. However, it was the same old story, defeat and being sent back to the reservation. Grandfather did not like the white man's reservation, however, and soon returned to the part of the country that he left. It was by some very good luck and the help of a white friend in Wairika, he was able to buy some land near Tule Lake up in the mountains. He then built a cabin there and lived there from then on until his death. He died in 1935. He fell asleep on a riverbank and never awakened again. You know, that'd be a good way to go. I wouldn't mind that. Grandfather lived a long and eventful life, but not always a happy one. He told me this story as a child, and I never tired of hearing it. His first contact with Sasquatch was one evening in the summer of 1897. Let's stop here for a second. Stories going back that far mean a lot to me. A lot of things can get twisted with times. Stories this old? Wasn't a lot out there about Sasquatch Bigfoot. In fact, the name Sasquatch Bigfoot didn't exist back then. Probably just a big hairy looking guy. He's walking along a deer trail near a lake just about dusk when he saw up ahead something that looked like a tall bush. Upon coming a little closer, he became aware of a strong odor sort of musky. He then gave a close look at the bush and suddenly realized it was not a bush at all, for it was covered from head to foot with thick, coarse hair, much like horse hair. He took a step closer, but the creature made a sound that sounded like nya. Grandfather now knew that this was one of those that he had heard the old ones tell about, a Sasquatch. Although it was growing darker, grandfather, not grandfather didn't say scratch, Sasquatch, the grandson saying that now. Although it was growing darker, grandfather was able to see quite Clearly, two soft brown eyes through the hairy head part. Then the creature moved slightly, and the grandfather made a motion of friendship and laid down a string of fish that he had been carrying. The creature evidently understood this, and it quickly snatched up the fish, fish struck out through the timber nearby, stopped only for a moment, and made a sound that my grandfather never forgot. A long, low, agum. Grandfather never told anyone outside the family this story, and he called them people. He referred to them as people called Mata Kagmi. Mata Kagmi. Now here is something that is most interesting and doubtful that it could be by chance, and that is that the people in Tibet called the so-called snowmen Mito Kangmi, M-E-T-O-H space K-A-N-G-M-I. The two names are very much alike. That's what it said in here. It was only a few weeks after this encounter with the Mata Kagmi that he was awakened one morning by a strange noise outside his cabin. Upon investigating, he found a stack of deer skins, fresh and ready for tanning. Off in the distance, he heard the strange sound once again, Agum. After this, there were other items left from time to time, such as wood for fuel and wild berries and fruits. It was a few years later that Grandfather had a second but far more amazing contact with the Sasquatch. Grandfather had taken a job with some white men from San Francisco area to help them search for some treasure that was supposedly on Mount Shasta. Now, Grandfather never cared much for money, but times had changed for the Indian and living off the land was a little harder now. However, these men had a map of some kind and were bound that they would find gold in question, so Grandfather agreed to act as a guide. However, he could scarcely conceal the fact that the thought of all whites a little crazy that searched for this yellow metal. Even though they assured Grandfather that he, they found the gold, he would be a rich man, this made little or no difference to him. After the treasure party had reached the foot of Mount Shasta, the whites began drinking a lot, so Grandfather told them he would go ahead and explore some of the lower level rock shelves, as they were in no condition to do so themselves. Soon that morning, he set up the mountain, set off up the mountain, on an, and after quite a bit of rough climbing, he reached the shelf 
that he wished to examine. Then it happened. He was struck in the leg, leg by a timber rattler. So let me tell you, timber rattlers are bad, bad, bad. They can kill you for sure. Grandfather killed the snake and started to come back down to a more comfortable spot, but soon found it difficult to go on, and as best as he can remember, he became sick to his stomach and fainted. When he came around again, he thought he was dreaming, for he was surrounded by three large Sasquatch about eight to ten feet tall. He noted that they had made a small cut on the snake bite and had somehow removed some of the venom and placed cool moss on the bite. Then one of the Matagagmi made a kind of grunting sound, and the two lifted him up and took him down the trail that he did not know. Finally, after some little descent down the mountainside, they placed him under a low, brushy tree and left. A gran Again, Grandfather heard the mournful cry of the Sasquatch, Agum. After a while, he began to feel better, and then took his old 44 caliber cap and ball pistol and began to fire some shots in the air. Finally, the gold party found him. Grandfather said nothing about what happened concerning the Sasquatch. He was smart. <laughs> these, these gold guys probably would have thought, oh, he's an idiot making up crap to get us off the mountain. So he's smart not to say anything. He was taken back to where the pack mules were tied and then onto the nearest little townlet where he rested for a few days and then returned to Tule Lake. Grandfather told only his immediate family about this encounter, and after this would never take anyone for any amount of money to Mount Shasta region. He would only say, Matakagmi lives, the holy place, I have friends there. For many years in the still of the evening or sometimes late at night, he would still hear the sound he all knew, Agum, the call of the Sasquatch. Grandfather went on to relate that the Matakagmi were not vicious, but were very shy, especially of the white man and they generally only came out in the evenings and at night. They lived chiefly on roots, they dug in berries, and only ate meat in the bitterest of cold weather. Their homes are in the deep burrows of the mountainsides unknown to man. I never tired of these stories that my grandfather told me as a boy, and he said they were true, and I believed him. May his spirit always know peace. Heard that story a lot, and I've spent a lot of time around Shasta. There are many people who had relatives to this individual who said that this story was true that I spoke to. Do I think it's true? I do. I think it is true. This is from Indian Giants from the Northern Rockies. Ella E. Clark, University of Oklahoma Press, 1977. Giants were formerly common in the Coeur d'Alene country. They had a very strong odor, like odor of burning horn. Their faces were black. Some say they were painted black, and the giants were taller than the highest teepees. When they saw a single teepee or lodge in a place, they would crawl up on it, rise, and look down into the smoke hole as several lodges were together. Imagine laying on your back in the teepee and you look up and their faces looking down at you. Most of them dressed in bear skins, but some wore other kinds of skins with the hair left on. They lived in caves or in rocks. Remember that? They had a great liking for fish and often stole fish out of the people's traps. Likewise, they did not bother people much. They are said to have stolen women occasionally in other tribes, but there's no tradition of their having stolen women in the Coeur d'Alene country. Other supernatural thing, beings that used to be seen in Coeur d'Alene and Spokane countries were called the tree men. They too had a strong odor. They dressed in buffalo skins and had the power of transforming themselves into trees and bushes. Once when a number of people were dancing in Spokane country near a small lake, close to the present day Cheney, they suddenly smelled a bad odor. One of them exclaimed, it's, it's a tree man. People looked around and saw four men standing a little apart from one another and wearing buffalo skins with the hair out to the side. As soon as they saw the people looking at them, they disappeared. Okay, another article about China's hairy wild men is a beast. China has 1.2 billion people. Ho Zenlin is looking for a size 48 foot. 
a naturalist, a tracker, stalker, and China's hulking, hairy, secretive wild man. If the eastern equivalent of a Bigfoot roams in these remote virgin forests, Mr. Who seems the man likely to find one. For more than a decade, he has searched high and low for the wild man, obsessed by an 81 encounter that left him convinced of their existence. Camping out in a cave one frozen night, he heard a loud, ripping sound. Horror overtook him. The hair on his hair bristled. He unsheathed his knife and cowered in a sleeping bag. The next morning, destruction surrounded his cave hideout. Trees were torn from the roots, scattered in the fresh white snow. Giant footprints were everywhere in the snow. I developed the sixth sense that night, the sense of a wild man in our midst, he says. Big Feet Mystery Wild men are paleontological mysteries. Doubters say they are the figments of untamed imaginations. But Mr. Sue has his theories. He thinks there are a late link between the apes of 15 million years ago and prehistoric human cave dwellers. He would like to befriend a wild man and bring one in for scientific questioning. We need to catch one, he says. It would solve our problems. Like the hunt for the Bigfoot in the U.S., the abdominal snowman in Tibet, this has proved exceedingly frustrating. Wild men and the wild women and even wild nuclear families have been seen and heard but never captured. Still, the descriptions have been consistent enough to provide a reasonably clear wild man composite. They stand about six feet tall, are stoutly built, red hair covers most of their bodies, forming a mane flowing elegantly down their backs. If you look at the Patterson-Gimlin film, right down the center of that biped's back is a thick growth of hair. L pay attention to this. Labr this is in the Wall Street Journal, by the way, uh, Friday, July 8th, 1994. Laboratory tests of hair fragments indicate the, clo the hair is closer in texture to human hair than the burly hair of apes. Laboratory tests of hair fragments indicate the hair is closer in texture to human hair than the burly hair of apes, says Mr. Who. Wild men have nearly human faces no tail and no claws. Hello! Did you hear that? Wild men have nearly human faces. <laughs> they have gigantic feet. Rangers in the Shenangia forest, about 600 miles west of Shanghai, have had the closest encounters with wild men. Though strong enough to uproot trees, they appear to be curious and friendly. So, anyhow, that's the part I wanted to get across. And you see, in China, they have, they have no dog in the fight. They're just trying to prove what's true. Here, you're getting fed a constant dose of rhetoric in order to move your mind over and think like they want you to think. The Siatko, this is the Puyallup and the Nisqually. AMS Press, New York, 1969. A race of tall Indians called Wild or Stick Indians was said to wander the forest in general conversation. They were referred to as a Siatko. They lived by hunting and fishing. Their homes were hollowed out like sleeping places for animals. It was largely because of this lack of houses and villages that they were characterized as wild. The giants played pranks on the village Indians, stealing the fish in their nets at night, going off with their half-cured supplies under cover of darkness. The giants were dangerous to the men if the men interfered with them and caused to hurt one of their members. Under these conditions, their hatred was implacable, and they always tracked the couple down until they finally killed them with a shot from their bows. Occasionally, also, they stole children and adolescents and carried them off to act as wives or slaves. For this re reason, children were mortally afraid of going out alone. Actual killing or capture of giants was said to have been infrequent, Two or more detailed accounts were, this is one of them, my grandfather's time, salt water, around 1850, his people captured a Seattle boy and raised it. The child slept all day, then went out at nights when everyone else was asleep. In the morning, they would see where you had piled up wood, caught fish, and brought in a deer. Finally, they told him he could go back to his people. He was gone many years, and they came back once. He brought a Seattle band with him, and the Indians could hear them whistle all around. He said he came just to visit to see them, then he went away for good. Second one, a man from Skyhomish, who was a little older than I am, told me that he and his friends killed a Seattle once. 
There were several of them, but others got away. It was in the daytime, and maybe they couldn't see so well. The one they killed had a bow and arrow and was dressed in some kind of skin. Cougar, I guess. And we're moving on. So there was also a group of Indians called Stick Shower Indians. This is an excerpt from Legends Beyond Psychology by Henry James Franzoni and Kyle Mizakami, and reprinted with permission. It says that the Stick Shower is tall and slender. He's a good runner. He has medicine which gives him swiftness and strength. Some Indians, some Indians claim his medicine renders him invisible. They go long distance at night. Maybe they hunt over the Columbia River near the Dalles early in the night. Next morning, they are over the Yakima country, all up Yakima River. Stick showers are good hunters. Nothing can get away from them. Nothing can escape them. I stated this to you because... And I learned this from Harvey Pratt. Native Americans are big on herbs. And what I mean by that is that they lived in the wild before there was medicine. And so they learned to use herbs. And Harvey gave me this. What is it? This is a little medicine pouch made of leather. I carry it with me everywhere. Safety medicine. And Harvey told me that he made it up specifically for me, and it's to keep me safe. Make sure I don't get hurt. Make sure I live. And a lot of Native Americans carry these little pouches. I've carried it for 12 years. So, do I believe the herb story? Just because I know that so many of the herbs that they use are true. And they truly do things, and it's been put down by uh, our drug medicine companies because if you heard of these herbs in the woods that could cure you for free, make your stomach ache go away, let's say, that's not good for the medicine that they want you to buy in the store, right? So, yeah, Harvey's the expert on the herbs, not me. Next story is, this one's interesting. An Indian named Lowaptis One Feather related the following two stories to McWhorter around 1918. A few of us were hunting in the mountains of the back agency, the Yakima Indian Agency. Far from camp, I determined to spend the night alone. Selecting a campsite near the old government sawmill, I proceeded to gather wood and prepare a light supper. While thus engaged, I heard a short distance below me English voices in a conversation. I suppose the campers were there, perhaps hunters, and I thought to call them as I perfected my camp. I noticed that my horse pricked its ears and gazed in that direction of the voices, turning his head for that purpose. Finally, I had my camp arranged to my notion and picking up my rifle, I walked down the slope to where the talking was going on. I had advanced but a short distance when the talking ceased. I continued, however, until I thought I was on the spot once the voices emanated. No sign of the man or camp could be seen. It was still semi-twilight, and I stood somewhat puzzled in doubt. I heard as distinctly as I ever heard anything ever, click, click, of a gun being cocked, apparently a musket or a heavy old-fashioned rifle, only a few feet away. Not doubting, but that I was discovered by an enemy seeing my life, I sprang behind a tree, rifle ready for instant use, thus sheltered. I stood in rigid expectation of momentary attack. But no attack came, and after the interval of suspense, I stepped from cover, half expecting to draw fire. All was still, save the murmur of a little stream. This is important. In Missing 411 The Hunted, I spent eight days with Ron Moorhead at his Sierra camp. And in the camp, his team had experienced some of the most unusual things you can imagine. And we were there because there had been disappearances around that camp. 
miles away. And because they had seen UFOs fly through camp, they had seen giant tracks around camp, they had recorded a language identified by Scott Nelson in camp. And Ron and I were talking one night very to things similar to what we're talking about right here. And Ron said, well, Dave, how far do you think we are from a roadway? I said, no, we've got to be 12 air miles at least. And he goes, yeah, that's probably fair. He said, one night in the middle of the night, we were getting ready to go to bed. And just as we're sitting here, we heard a car door open and close loudly. <laughs> I said, what do you make of that? He goes, I don't know. We heard a lot of strange sounds here. A lot of them were almost as though they were perfectly recorded and mimicked. So in this instance, where this is heard and he goes down and nothing's there, it doesn't surprise me at all. Now these are not things that mainstream TV is going to talk about because it's too kooky. You know, uh, the Native Americans can believe that, but we're, we're far too, too uptight and our belts are too tight to, to think that's true. Yeah, well, until you hear it. <laughs> this one's uh, from Legends Beyond Science by Henry James and Kyle Mazakomi. Ellis C. Clark in Indian Legends of the Pacific Northwest in 1953 defines the Siatko as an evil spirit greatly feared by the Indians of the Oregon and Washington coast, coasts. The lake, Spirit Lake, at the foot of the beautiful Lewitt or the Mount St. Helens was the home of many evil spirits. They were the spirits of different tribes who had been cast out because of their wickedness. Banding themselves together, the demons called themselves the Siatko. The Siaka were neither men nor animals. They could imitate the call of any bird, the sound of the wind in the trees, the cries of the wild beasts. They could make sounds seem to be near or seem to be far away. They were often able to trick the Indians. A few times the Indians fought them, but whenever one of the Siaka was killed, the others took 12 lives from whatever band dared fight them. In the snow on the mountaintop above the lake, the Indians used to say a race of man-stealing giants lived. At night, the giants would come to the lodges when people were asleep and put their people under their skins and take them to the mountaintop without waking them. When the people awoke in the morning, they would be entirely lost, not knowing where their home was. Frequently, the giants came at night and stole all their salmon. If people were awake, they knew the giants were near when they smelled their strong, unpleasant odor. Sometimes people would hear three whistles, and soon stones would begin to hear, hit their lodges. Then they knew the giants were coming again. There were other kinds of people living in the dark. Their names were the Siatka, wild people. They are tall, slim fellows with a nose about here in the center of the forehead. Their eyes are round and big, silver dollar size. They are good hunters. They kill deer whenever they want. They hunt with bows and arrows, no gun. They are bad people. If they find you sleeping anywhere in nighttime, they tie you up, maybe kill you. Do not bother the Siatka. The tales of Siatka or Siatka are from tribes that lived near Mount St. Helens. For the Coquille Indians who live in the southern Oregon coast, the Siatka was a bit different. A Coquille Indian named Indian Mary told a story around the turn of the century. Siatko, evil spirit of the ocean, caused the storms to blew up and down the coast. He killed fish and threw them on the beach. Sometimes he swallowed canoes and fishermen. Many tribes did not know Siatko and did not fear him. Whenever they came down the coast to trade or attend potlatches, they brought with them their families, horses, and dogs, and children. An Indian princess was swimming one night in the moonlight when suddenly a black hand passed across the moon, and she was seized by a creature that came out of the water. Siatko claimed her as his own and started towards his cliff with her. He held the girl close to him, trying to make her look into his eyes, but she turned face away and looked at the moon. She remembered Siatko's power lay in its eyes. 
Yeah, I've heard that many times. Don't stare a Bigfoot in its eyes. It's not good. So I've, I've read you some of, some, probably 15% of what I first read that first four or five days. And I pulled you out some of the best ones. This helped build my framework to understand what's going on. Now, this is not by far all of them. But these are stories you don't hear about anywhere else. Because again, in the minds of many, these, don't, these aren't credible. They are incredible. But when Ron Moorhead told me his story, when other super credible people have told me their stories, you can't dismiss this. Important thing that I talked to you about today, the weight issue. And that article that talked about, does it come from outer space? Well, friends, many things in the Native American culture, many of the beliefs is that they came from the stars. It's quite a coincidence. Remember the DNA, half human, half never categorized. How can that be? We categorize everything on Earth. So if it's not from Earth, where did it come from? It obviously has some kind of powers that we don't have. It has strength we don't have. It has a language we don't have. It weighs way more than us, pound for pound, inch for inch, density by density, just by the indentation it leaves in the ground. So when someone's thinking out loud and says, well, could this be half human and half robot or half human and half synthetic? I don't know. Possible, I guess. But who am I to dismiss it? What if it turned out to be true? So you got to keep walking this line, trying to understand and hope that you're going to have that epiphany moment, right? Well, I hope this was entertaining, number one. Number two, I hope you learned something. Number three, I want this to help you be that base of knowledge. Don't be swayed by degrees, smooth talk. Be swayed by facts and by history, not recent history. To me, the older the history, the more credible. And keep an open mind. But if something doesn't pass the smell test, the common sense test, oh yeah, you know, it's, it's the great white panda. We've got a thousand of them living in the United States. Forget about the fact that nobody's ever killed one. We don't have any bones. We don't have any fur. We've never found any feces. Just believe they're there. What's the difference between that and saying Gigantopithecus is here? No evidence it's here. They've never found anything that's saying it's here. <laughs> okay, you understand. So that concludes another class, 55 minutes. So I gave you some time to go on your break, uh, go to the lunch counter, get something healthy, get some carrots and some, some water and talk to your friends about class and Tell them that, hey, go to Politis' class, sign up, next, sign up next quarter. It'll be entertaining. All right? I appreciate you being here. Be nice to your neighbors. And when you're at the store next time and you see some older person that needs some help with their groceries, go over there and do something nice and help them. 
you know, make you feel good, and that's the way society ought to be. Politis out.